Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person who's gathered here today. I thank you for our students, all the hard work that went into this this week. I thank you that they've all returned safe and sound without uh, any heat stroke. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the work that they've put in. God, I just pray that they would have had an encounter with you and have uh, found deeper relationship in this community. And Father, I just pray for each one of us in this room. God, we, we come here on a Sunday morning taking time out of our, our schedule to meet with you. God, I pray that we would find you. But God, that we would also see you throughout the rest of our week and not just be limited to an hour or two on Sunday morning. God, may your spirit be moving in our church and in this community. And Father, I ask this morning that you give me the words to speak and open up the ears and the hearts of those who need to hear this message today. We pray this in your son's precious and holy name. And all God's people said? So growing up in South Mississippi, we had two signs on our fence that ran the perimeter of our yard. The first sign said, caution, electric fence. The second sign said, beware of dog. Now, we had the electric fence because we had a dog that would try to escape at any given opportunity. Uh, first couple years we had him, we always had to have him on a runner or a leash. And any time that he wasn't on the runner or the leash, he would look at you and then look at the fence and then look at you again and then run to the fence. And he, I've never seen a dog do it. The dog just climbed that uh, chain link fence like that and he was off into the neighborhood. And then we were spending hours trying to track him down. So there was no good way to keep him apart from him always being locked up, keep him inside the yard. So eventually we had to buy an electric fence and run that wire around the perimeter of the yard. And uh, so we put the sign up, caution electric fence, because there were certain handles you had to unhook in order to open and come in and out of the gate. Now the beware of dog sign, it's actually a misnomer. Our dogs would lick you to death before they would do anything else. But what the unintended consequence of those two signs were, we never had solicitors. Consequently, we never had trick-or-treaters either. They, they just did, they did not stop at our house. We did have one set of very brave Mormons make it to our front door. They got past the electric fence. They braved the dogs. They rang the doorbell. We were so impressed. We invited them in for cookies. It's like, kudos to you guys. We'll hear you out. Um, but the purpose of the signs were to help People to proceed with caution. Today, we're looking at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, and in it, Jesus offers up several cautionary statements. So I want us to look at that this morning. If you have your Bibles, open up with me to Matthew chapter 7. We'll start in verse 13. Jesus says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for Wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you, like, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do, do, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished, finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So, 
Jesus is issuing these beware statements using a variety of metaphors, but all with basically the same meaning. And so he says, beware the wide gate, beware the false prophet, beware the bad fruit, beware of taking him for granted, and beware of rejecting his teachings. So let's take a moment to dive into each one of those. He first starts with the contrast between the wide gate that a lot of people enter through and the narrow gate that only a few people enter through. Now, you may ask yourself, what are they entering into? Well, this, this is the, the choice, the path you choose in life that leads to the next life. And he says there's, there's a way to life that's really easy. A lot of people choose it. It's the way of this world. It's what comes naturally to you. Now, on the other hand, there's a, a way to life that's not as easy. In fact, it's, it's rather tough. Not, not as many people opt in for this way of life. But it's the kingdom of God. It's what Jesus talks about as following him to deny yourself, to pick up your cross and follow him daily. That's the narrow way. But he says, beware, beware the wide gate. It's easy. It's attractive. Lots of people Go that direction, but it doesn't lead to greater life. In fact, it leads to permanent death. Now, one commentary I read when it was talking about the narrow gate, it described it like this. It says, true discipleship is a minority religion. I'll say that again. True discipleship following Jesus, growing more like Jesus, the sanctification process, true discipleship is a minority religion. Not everybody is going to choose the narrow gate because the narrow gate is going to cost you something. So don't expect everybody to make that choice. Now, I've, I've listened to Christian voices all the way back into the 90s when I started to pay attention to these things. I've listened to Christian voices for decades decry the, the cultural shift we've seen in this country. And it certainly has picked up pace in recent years. And while, yes, I want to see people come to God, I also would like to see the veil of cultural Christianity slip away. You know, when you grow up in a Christianese culture, everybody kind of goes with the flow. But the problem with that is that, that nobody has to make a real choice, a real decision, or uh, have to make any type of meaningful sacrifice. Yet as cultural Christianity g uh, gives way to secularism and pluralism and moralism and all the other isms out there, what is going to remain is true Christianity. Because Jesus and the church, they aren't going anywhere. But cultural Christianity, and you need to understand this, cultural Christianity in our country is going extinct. But here's the thing. The early church, the early church was a counter-cultural movement that absolutely changed the world. It's when it was adopted by the Roman Empire as the official religion that it Christianity becomes institutionalized and you start to see it become watered down. So what I want you to understand is don't be afraid of Christianity becoming countercultural again because therein lies its power to actually affect change in the world. Small is the gate and narrow is the path to life, but it's worth it. Next, Jesus says, beware of false prophets. Now, what do you think of when you hear the term false prophets? It's not something we normally throw around in a normal vocabulary. For me, it conjures up the, the, uh, what I've seen in recent years of, of religious leaders making bold political uh, predictions that end up not turning out to be, not, not panning out. Or those over the last decades or even centuries that have led groups of people into believing that, that this is the end of times and yet we are still here. What these people have done is that they make claims in the name of Jesus that turn out to be false and they usually have asked for money all along the way. The Lord says this in the book of Jeremiah. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. 
They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord will, says you will have peace. And to all who follow stubbornness of, the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord? Or which, which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or to hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? The Lord says, beware of those who speak in my name but haven't heard from me lately. And that's not limited to just like uh, predicting the future or, or politics. It's, it translates into to the things that people say about you. The, the, the platitudes, the fortune cookie wisdom that people will offer up and say, oh, this is going to happen in your life. And it, and it doesn't pan out. It doesn't come to pass. What I've come to learn is that not everybody who comes to you and says, I have a word from the Lord for you, is either truthful or has your best interest in mind. And Jesus understands that this is the case. It has continued to be the case. And so he says, test their words by their works in their life. Do you see evidence of good fruit being formed, Jesus says. Now, Paul will later on explain what that fruit looks like. He says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. People who exude that fruit in their life, Jesus says, those people are trustworthy. Those are the people you should be listening to. But if that is what the good fruit in our life looks like, then the bad fruit that Jesus is referring to seemingly would mean the opposite, right? So it would mean things like apathy, despair, trouble, quick-temperedness, inconsiderateness, meanness, roughness, and lack of self-control. If you see that fruit being produced in the life of the per people you are listening to, Jesus puts a warning sign up that says, beware. But then Jesus issues another warning. That not everybody who thinks they're going to be with him is going to be with him into eternity. And many are going to be surprised that they're not. But this goes back to that cultural Christianity bit. There are people who are Christian on the census. They tick off that box. They're Christian on paper, but they're not Christian in their home. There are those who wear a cross around their neck, but don't pick up their cross daily to follow him. There are those who know about Jesus, but don't actually know Jesus personally. And Jesus says, John 14, 21, he says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. Friends, if, if you follow Jesus, you'll be with Jesus. But if you don't follow Jesus, you won't be with Jesus. And Jesus iterates this again in Matthew chapter 25 when he says, And he will say to them on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed. Into the eternal fire prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They will also, they also will answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Friends, to follow Jesus is to love and serve those around you. Many think that they know Jesus, but did nothing in his name to actually love other people. Jesus says, you may, you may have done things in my name, but if you didn't do it out of love, then it was pointless. You may have gone so far as to prophesy and to cast demons out in my name, but if you didn't do it out of love and service, you haven't truly followed me. Then Jesus closes out the Sermon on the Mount with an analogy about building, about construction. That wise is the, the person who 
builds their house upon a rock, a solid foundation, versus the foolish one who builds their house on a sand, a not solid foundation. Got me to thinking, um, a couple weeks ago, I got an opportunity to go down to Galveston with some church members, and it was me, Amy, and Ava, and got to spend a few days on the beach, and uh, I, I taught Ava how to boogie board on this trip. Now, I've tried teaching her in the past, didn't work. She's finally ready at age six to boogie board. And that child, she rode waves for days. After the first day of riding and she caught on, she told me, Daddy, tomorrow I'm gonna teach you how to ride the boogie board. I'm like, okay. And sure enough, next day she's out there giving me lessons. I'm like, who taught you yesterday? So, I, was, I spent most of my time on the beach riding waves in and walking back out, riding waves in. Had a blast with her, great memories. But in one of the few moments where I actually got to sit down, uh, we, our group, they, they had taken the, their chairs and put them in the water right as the waves were coming in. Now, mind you, they had chairs that had uh, the, the metal that went, uh, the two metal bars that sat well into the sand. But the chair I grabbed uh, had four legs. Not so great. And so I'm sitting in the water. Uh, at the water's edge, the waves are coming in, these four legs. And as every time the, the waves came in, it sucked sand back out from underneath me, but not at an even pace. So this leg would go down, and then this leg would go down, and then this leg would go down, and this leg. I felt like I was on a bucking bronco I, as, as the sand is slowly just absorbing the legs of my chair. I finally said, I forget this, I'll go ride waves with Ava again. The point being, sand is a horrible foundation because it shifts. Friends, if you build your life on the cultural sands of this world, you are in for trouble. Waves come in and the wind rages and the cultural sands you built your life on will shift. They may shift slowly or they may shift rapidly, but it's not going to be stable. But Jesus says, wise is the one who builds their life on the foundation of my teachings. When the waves come in and the winds rage, you've got something solid that you are attached to. You know, we've just wrapped up. This is the 10th week in our series on the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus closes this sermon with a very clear statement that you would be wise to heed his words. That you should build your life on these words because it's in these words you find eternal life. But beware if you don't. Life comes in waves. Whether you follow Jesus or you don't follow Jesus, life comes in waves. Winds swirl and storms are going to brew. If Jesus is your rock, you actually stand a chance to not be battered by life. Yet, if anything else, if you are anchored to anything that is not Jesus, you don't stand a chance at all. Now, Matthew closes out this story of Jesus giving this sermon by, by saying that those who listened to him were astonished by the authority in which he taught them. Because that was very different than the other religious leaders at the time. The other rabbis of Jesus' age were very wishy-washy. Ah, it could be this. Ah, it could be that. Some interpret it this way. Others interpret it that way. And they were astonished that Jesus preached with the authority and the command of the space that he did. Why? Because he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Jesus is the absolute truth. So friends, anchor your life on him. Open up your Bibles. I encourage you, open up your Bibles and daily glean from this truth. Read it. Study it. Don't let Sunday be the only time that you are infused with the truth of God. Because if this isn't the biggest influence on your life and worldview, then whether you know it or not, you are constructing your life on cultural sands that will shift. So beware of what you let most influence you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for I thank you for this sermon. I thank you that it is it is a hard thing to read. 
And God, anywhere where we are feeling stretched, God, let us see this as an opportunity to grow, to not be condemned, but to walk closer with your son Jesus as we, as we mature in our faith. But God, help us be aware of these things. God, help us be ones who are growing good fruit in our lives. May your spirit work within us to bring about the maturing of our faith. Father, we pray all of this as we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.